This is a story about Shanghai's dreams. It is a plan that began 20 years ago. A plan to build the most iconic building in Shanghai. The building's 632 meter height will surpass the Jin Mao Tower and the Shanghai World Financial Center. This is a bold reimagining of the vertical city. It will be the first time the dual layer glass facade is used in a mega tall skyscraper. It will be equipped with 24 perfectly manicured sky gardens for a comfortable, eco friendly future. This is the story of Shanghai's last skyscraper, the Shanghai Tower. It is set to stun the world. But first, it has to be built in a difficult environment under the judgmental eyes of those around it. Pudong, Shanghai, the bustling financial district, Liu Jiazui. At six in the morning, workers from everywhere rush to the construction site. In the next five days, they will have to construct the concrete structure of the skyscraper's 35th story and the steel structure of the 25th story. This means they will have to transport 12 100 ton steel beams up to 50 kilometers worth of rebar and 80 truckloads of concrete to the construction site. They will need to install these materials 180 meters up in the sky. This 1,000 ton steel platform needs to be raised by another 4 meters. While four of these tower cranes, the biggest in the world, need to be raised by another 20 meters. This is a mere fraction of the work involved in this construction project. But none of these challenges present a problem for the workers constructing what will be the tallest building in Shanghai, the Shanghai Tower. So, what is the problem? This will be the first Chinese building taller than 600 meters. It's estimated that the weight of the building will be 800,000 tons. That's a lot. The soil in this area is soft. It's not going to be easy to construct this building here. There are many unseen dangers in the construction of this building. It will require the utmost courage and diligence. The underground border of the Shanghai Tower will be the second lane of this road, where our crew is surveying over there. The Jin Mao Tower's underground border is around where those red flowers are. They're about 20 meters apart from each other. Actually, this is extremely dangerous for those involved in the construction. Very dangerous. Will the Shanghainese people and the business elites of the world accept this new building? Nobody knows for sure. Giant skyscrapers are always controversial. The Shanghai Tower will be the last major building in Lu Jiazui. Everybody is looking at this building. This really puts tremendous pressure on all of us. There's no room for failure here. For over 20 years, the pressure has been building for the building's engineers. Just 170 years ago, Shanghai was a small little city built around its salt works. In 1842, it was marked for development. This city on the Yangtze River Delta, right in the middle of the north and south of China, quickly became the international trade hub of the country. It caught the tail end of the skyscraper craze happening in the west. In September 1929, the first building over 10 stories high, the 77-meter Sassoon House, was built. Five years later, the 83.8-meter tall Shanghai Joint Saving Society building became the tallest building in Asia.
In just 20 years, the skyline of the Bund became one of the most emblematic sites of East Asia in the first half of the 20th century. Since the economic reform, the Shanghainese have once again remade their city into the Pearl of the East. In 1993, development started in Pudong. Since then, its appearance has changed every day, reflecting its great ambition. In 2020, Shanghai aims to be an international financial hub like Hong Kong and Tokyo. As the old gives way to the new, this shining international metropolis will have to revamp its appearance to rival the Bund. I remember back in 1993, there was a city plan for Pudong that earmarked three super tall skyscrapers in this area. At the time, we were hoping that Lu Jiazui would have a complete skyline of its own. And it would be formed by the tallest skyscraper in the middle, two shorter ones by its side, and then gradually getting shorter and shorter. So the tallest one would be more than 400 meters, the shorter ones 200 meters, and the shortest ones around 100 meters. In 1999, the Jinmao Tower was completed. It was 420.5 meters tall. In 2008, the Shanghai World Financial Center was completed. It was 482 meters tall. The ideal skyline will be completed by one last skyscraper. After some argument, the name Shanghai Tower is chosen. It is meant to represent the future cityscape of Shanghai. But how will such a building's appearance live up to its name? This is a question better answered by the professionals. In 2006, the Shanghai Tower put out a call for design proposals from all over the world. Its design will be a world-class challenge. Just one block north of the Shanghai Tower is the 88-story high Jinmao Tower. Its facade draws on the traditional Chinese tiered pagoda architecture, melding eastern and western influences. To the east lies the Shanghai World Financial Center. Its design resembles a sword, regal and austere. Its observation deck lies on the 100th floor. It is the tallest one in the world. For a long time, these two buildings were the symbols of finance, trade, fashion, and modern lifestyle. We're the third mega skyscraper in the area. We can't just think about ourselves. We need to figure out a way to integrate ourselves with the two existing ones. More than that, the architect's designs will have to draw people's attention from there to here. The architectural firm Gensler has never attempted a megatall skyscraper before. They hope to put themselves on the world map with this building. Leading the design team is Art Gensler from the U.S. and Jun Xia from China. You know, this building is about the past and it's a beautiful building. This building is about the present and it's a fine building, but Jun really created a building that's special that's about the future. Yeah, I think that the, the design concept need to be understand this through building together as a family. After some fierce competition, Gensler, a firm that specialized in interior design, is awarded the project. They need a strong concept in order to stand out. park like this into the megatall skyscraper of the Shanghai Tower.
To achieve this park in the sky concept, the firm has chosen to use a dual layer glass facade in the design. The two layers of glass only come together every 10 stories. This creates an airy, spacious atrium that lets the sunlight in while keeping bad weather at bay. But this design comes with its risks. The design of this building is very innovative, but it brings with it many technical challenges. Like, how are we going to construct the outer layer? The outer layer of the building twists as it rises. This gives it a dynamic sense of movement. But will the building's investors accept it? Now we have two layers instead of just one. Does this make sense for them, uh, economically? The architects have to try to reduce the cost of adding an outer layer. They went from having a cuboid-shaped inner and outer layer to making the inner layer cylindrical. They further altered that to make the outer layer pyramidal. The edges of the pyramid are rounded to reduce wind pressure. At the same time, the smooth curves will accommodate the sharp, regal edges of the Jin Mao Tower and the World Financial Center. Because of this design, the outer layer will only require 18% more glass. With the final design in tow, the architects are still nervous. The Shanghai Tower received 19 proposals, all of which came from top architectural firms around the world. After a year of eliminations, Gensler made it to the final round. Its competitor is the English firm Norman Foster & Partners, who designed the Russia Tower, Terminal 3 of the Beijing Capital Airport, and the Hong Kong International Airport. Their attractive design is based on the ink brush. The building would have smooth lines, while its facade would be transparent and luminous. We can't double guess them. We can only do what is within our control. Finally, the results are announced. Relief. relief. It was a sense of relief. Like a great weight was lifted off our shoulders. Yes, it's finally over. All the brain work and anticipation was worth it. Gensler's green design has been approved by the panel. People can finally picture the Shanghai Tower in their heads. They can't wait to see this beautiful design come to fruition and tower over the Shanghai skyline. On the 29th of September, 2008, the Shanghai Tower officially breaks ground. The real challenge is now about to begin. For all the architects who dream of building skyscrapers in Shanghai, the soft soil of the city has always been a nightmare for them. Shanghai was built on an alluvial plain at the mouth of the Yangtze River. It has a soft, porous layer that is 280 meters deep. It is like building a tower on tofu. Geotechnical specialist Go Rong Gu demonstrates the danger of putting something heavy on a piece of tofu. This piece of tofu is like the soft ground of Shanghai. Look what happens when I put a model of the Shanghai Tower on it. The only solution for this is to drive piles deep into the ground that can bear the weight of the building and create friction with the soft ground. A solid base of reinforced concrete is then built on top of these piles. This will serve as the base of the skyscraper, making it steady and safe. Constructing the tallest building in Shanghai on soil like this gives Go Rong Gu and the chief engineer Tian Gong nightmares. If you don't find a good solution for this issue, then the consequences will be catastrophic. These pipelines may burst and the road may sink in. The buildings around it may start to sink too. The waterway will be destroyed and all the surrounding buildings will collapse. It'll be a huge disaster. So there mustn't be any mistake at all. 
The first question to address is, what kind of foundation can withstand a building weighing 800,000 tons or the equivalent weight of 70 Eiffel Towers? To do this, we drill three holes into the pile. When the concrete in the pile has half solidified, the engineers will inject grout at high pressure. The grout squeezes out all the dirt in the rock, filling up the spaces between the piles. This greatly increases the strength of the foundation. The same pile can now bear a weight of 3,100 tons. Experimental data shows that the piles can now bear three times their required weight. 955 86-meter-long piles will bear the 800,000-ton main building. This makes the building safe, but that is not all. In June of 2006, a construction accident happened in Shanghai, raising the concerns of geotechnical specialists. The Lotus Riverside complex collapsed because the topsoil was too soft, and the bulldozers caused a change in ground structure. We're building a really tall building here. This must never happen to us. The piles for our building have to be driven really deep into the ground. How does one ensure that such a tall building is absolutely safe? The engineers need to make sure that 5% of the entire building is underground. This means digging a giant hole that is 30 meters deep. But this presents a problem. The double yellow line in the middle of the road will be the underground limit of the Shanghai Tower. To dredge out the earth for this hole, one will have to disturb the soil of the Jin Mao Tower and the World Financial Center. This will leave only 20 meters of ground at one end. Nobody is willing to risk this. The safest way to proceed is to first dredge out the pit for the main building. Only when the other areas have been safely secured can dredging be carried out there. But even this pit is sufficient to give the engineers a headache. The diameter of the pit has to be 121 meters, and its depth has to be 33 meters. This is the largest mega-tall skyscraper to be built. It's also the deepest. Five days before the Chinese New Year of 2010, the pit of the main building is finally completed, but there is no time to celebrate. Right after the foundation pit is dug and before the concrete base is built, it's the most dangerous stage of the whole construction process. We cannot afford to wait at all. There will be no Chinese New Year holiday for the workers here. The engineers and the laborers have a massive reunion dinner together. They begin building the concrete base for the building. Just how big is this base? Its surface area is 1.6 times the size of a football field, and its thickness is six meters, equivalent to two stories high. The most crucial point is that the concrete has to be filled in all at once within 60 hours. This process requires 60,000 cubic meters of concrete in one shot. This has never been done before anywhere in the world. The biggest danger comes from the heat released from the hydration of the cement. When cement is mixed with water, a lot of heat is released. This heat is concentrated inside the concrete structure and can go up to 60 degrees Celsius. The difference between the internal and external temperatures can cause the concrete to crack, compromising the safety of the building. The engineers have to carefully control the super plasticizers in the concrete. This presents challenges in transporting the concrete. We will need 1,000 cubic meters of concrete every hour. That's a large amount of concrete. They have only one chance to do this right. If they fail, they will not be able to do it again. And the safety of the entire building will be severely compromised. On the 26th of March, 2010, 500 workers begin work on this with the help of 18 concrete pumps. 80% of all cement mixers in Shanghai are utilized to transport concrete from the concrete mixing stations to the construction site. After 63 hours of work, the unprecedented concrete base is finally completed. The workers can now begin construction on the building.
In September 2010, the Shanghai Tower finally emerges above ground after two years of work. The hopes of so many people are pinned on this building. It will become the new symbol of Shanghai's future. But one question hasn't been resolved. How tall should this building be? There have been many skyscrapers that came before this. The 381-meter Empire State Building, the 452-meter Petronas Towers, the 508-meter Taipei 101, the 828-meter Burj Khalifa. The heights of human engineering are increasing all the time. From a technical point of view, we could absolutely build a 700, 800-meter tall building. But the height is not so much an issue for the Shanghai Tower. It is not its goal to be the tallest building in China or in the world. The world's financial center is 70 meters taller than the Jinmao Tower. The Shanghai Tower will be another 140 meters taller than the world's financial center. There is a mathematical relationship behind the heights of these buildings. We want the three of them to form an upward arc. That way, they will form a nice skyline when all three of them are observed simultaneously. After some deliberation, the final height of the building is set to be 632 meters tall. But the taller the building, the more dangerous it will be for the construction workers. The height of the Shanghai Tower is set to be more than 600 meters. Just looking down gives one a feeling of dizziness and vertigo. It is even harder for the workers to work at this height. If a tiny screw falls from this height, it kills somebody below. The first element to be built is the reinforced concrete core of the building. This enormous 900 square meter cube structure has to be hollow for the elevator to pass through. But this core has to be completed at a rate of one story every five days. The high winds and fog add another level of difficulty to the construction process. How does one ensure the construction worker's safety? The solution to this problem is a super tool at the top of the core. Welcome to the steel platform of the Shanghai Tower. This platform services the topmost story of the construction. Workers have access to the topmost level of the building through an elevator. The edges of the platform are surrounded by two meter tall fences, blocking off the entire construction space. Acrophobia will no longer be a problem. Let's put it this way. Nobody who comes up to the platform will feel like they're on top of a tall building. Steel beams weighing more than 100 tons are hoisted up to the platform at night. The workers now have access to these beams. This way, everything remains safe, and they need not worry about things falling on their heads. But this creates a new problem. Once a story of the building is completed, how is the 1,000-ton steel platform transported to the next story? The engineers are inspired by rock climbing. The steel platform will use the newly completed concrete wall as the rock wall by which it climbs up. The supervisor of the steel platform, Gang Tian, is in charge of moving the platform to the next story. The arms and legs of the steel platform are the frames situated on the inside and outside of the building. They are fastened onto grooves on the wall with corbels. The outer frame is raised by two centimeters and the core bells are retracted. The entire frame is then lifted up through its cylinders. It is raised to the required height 
and then its core bells are extended again and used as load bearers. The outer and inner frames work interchangeably to raise the steel platform. After six hours, night has fallen. The steel platform is finally raised to the 35th story. The dawn of the new day brings 100 workers to work on the steel platform. Work begins on the 35th story of the support core. The first order of the day is to stack the steel bars. The workers begin stacking 50 kilometers worth of steel bars. Once the bars are stacked, they are bound by steel wires. and then welded together. All this needs to be finished in two days. Now that the mold is complete, the workers need to transport the concrete from there to here. The concrete will be transported through this pipe and the spreader at the top of the steel platform. This will eventually reach a height of 600 meters. But normal concrete cannot be transported so far up. Normal concrete can't be used in this situation. This is the sound of concrete being moved by high pressure pumps. These crashes are even more pronounced at the curves of the pipe. If normal concrete is used in these pipes, it will get stuck because of the sharp gravel that it is composed of. To solve this, the engineers change the structure of the gravel in the concrete. We call it fine gravel. It's much rounder and not as sharp edged as regular gravel. That means there are less sharp pieces than the concrete. This concrete is known as self-consolidating concrete. It is a compact concrete and doesn't even need mechanical vibration to flow smoothly up the pipe. This concrete can now be safely transported up to the 35th story. While the Shanghai Tower is being constructed at a rapid speed of one story every five days, a steel factory 40 kilometers away is hard at work and bustling with activity. The Shanghai Tower will be built from a cubic structural core. It will have eight giant pillars and four prism supports on the outer layer. The two layers of glass will be suspended on the steel structure, imparting a light, airy feel to the entire building. These steel frames are manufactured by two different factories, but installing the steel frame won't be an easy task at all. This will form part of Shanghai Tower's three-dimensional truss. And as you can see here, its structural traits consist of its peculiar shape and the thickness of the steel. The engineers need to make sure that these giant beams will fit snugly with each other at the construction site. To do this, they will have to pre-assemble the steel structure before delivery. But the steel components each already weigh over 3,000 tons. Each component will have to be 60 meters in diameter and 30 meters in height. It would take more than a month to pre-assemble these steel components. This process would cost way too much. Thankfully for the engineers, there is the BIM system. BIM is an acronym for Building Information Modeling. It gathers data on the design, implementation, equipment, and material. It then analyzes them on the computer, allowing different teams to work on it at the same time. With this platform, the different agents will know what their roles are. They'll know what they're supposed to do and where. Everyone will know how to work together. This system gathers all the information required and turns it into a three-dimensional model. It can simulate the completed building down to its minute details. It can tell you where a specific wall, a specific window, or a specific pipeline should be installed. It imagines the spatial relationship between different components. The human brain can't possibly visualize the building in this much detail. But with the BIM system, we can understand the structure as it should be and thus rectify problems immediately. 
Now the ideas of the architects can be properly analyzed and adjusted in the BIM system. This allows the actual implementation to remain completely faithful to the architectural ideas. The steel components in the factory can be accurately surveyed with a total station. Once their data is input into the BIM system, they can be pre-assembled without discrepancies. Presently, the steel components are ready to be transported to the construction site. The transportation supervisor, 64-year-old Mr. Pan, does so at night. We usually get to the construction site at 11 p.m. and work till 3 to 4 a.m. If there are more vehicles on the road, we'll work till 6 to 7 a.m. To get the giant steel components through the city, the transportation crew can only work at night. They work several nights in a row, delivering the components to the designated areas of the construction site. But tonight, things aren't going so well. When this 97-ton steel member is transported to the construction site, the engineers discover that there is a discrepancy in its position and they can't hoist it up. Limited space makes it difficult for flatbed trucks to maneuver. An hour later, Mr. Pan finally finds an acceptable spot. This is only the first truck of the night. The night will feel like an eternity. There are four M1280D tower cranes to lift these components. The cranes weigh 500 tons by themselves. They can bear a load of 100 tons. These are four of the biggest tower cranes in China. One of the crane operators, Gun Cheng Wei, has years of experience under his belt. I've been doing this for 40 years now. In 1996, I worked on the Jin Mao Tower. In 1999, I worked on the New World Tower. In 2003, I worked on the World Trade Plaza on Nanjing Road. In 2007, I worked on the Shanghai IFC. Although Wei gets to enjoy a great view every day, he also has to deal with the fear of being suspended in mid-air and the loneliness of working by himself. Crane operators work in 12-hour shifts. His only interaction with the world is through his walkie-talkie. The hook needs to be higher. It needs to be higher. The hook on the far side needs to be lower. More? Copy that. Working so high up in the air comes with its risks. In the US, an average of 82 people die each year in crane accidents. Combined with the fact that there are four tower cranes working at the same time, the risks involved are multiplied. If the cranes collide into each other, it will be a huge disaster. But Wei has his own way of dealing with this. The LCD display helps us monitor everything. We can monitor the movements of the crane behind us as we work. Things aren't going very well at the construction site today. A thunderstorm has caused the cranes to stop working. The girders get slippery when it rains, so we can't do any heavy lifting today. Not everyone is stopped by the rain, however. The hoisting team will continue installing the steel frame, despite the rain. On rainy days like this, the ground supervisor's job becomes even more important. The operators can't see anything right now. There's so much water on the glass. The workers manage to install the steel frame safely. At this moment, the sky starts to clear up. Gun Jing Wei can finally take a break.
tower crane. The height of the tower crane needs to be adjusted again. Amazingly, the tower cranes are raised on just two slender beams. Each crane is 60 meters long and weighs 500 tons. Yet it is able to raise itself on these two beams. During the entire construction period, each crane will have to be raised 27 times. The engineers will have to think about how to get these cranes down from an altitude of 600 meters once the construction is completed. The very last crane we transported down in the elevator. This elevator is the same one the workers use to go up and down every day. How are they going to transport such a massive crane in it? The secret lies in dismantling the cranes. Once the top of the building is sealed, the outer crane will go first. Then the medium-sized crane and the small crane will follow. A 500 kilogram small jib arm will be the last to go. Pudong, Shanghai. Lu Jiatui's last megatall skyscraper is being built from the ground up. Together with the Jinmao Tower and the World Financial Center, it will become the most significant landmark in Shanghai. The construction workers are using their sweat, their wits, and their guts to bring a 20-year-old dream into fruition. But much more than their colleagues at other construction sites, they are aware of this building's urgency. The controversy over megatall skyscrapers is intensifying. In the last 20 years, the drawbacks of megatall skyscrapers are starting to emerge. They cost a lot to build, consume a lot of energy, and are cutting people off from nature. They're only bustling with activity during the day. At night, they become ghost towns. These drawbacks have been getting a lot of attention lately. The creators of the Shanghai Tower need to find a way to address this. The key is in having the technology to address these complaints. The engineers plan to use the latest environmental technology to create a masterpiece of green architecture. To begin with, the building is committed to water recycling. At the top of the tower will be an enormous water catchment tank. It will collect rainwater into a reservoir and process the water for internal use within the building. The water it will save can fill 250 Olympic-sized pools. The building will also use wind for electricity. At the top of the building will be three groups of 15 wind turbines. At its 600-meter height, wind speeds of 6 meters per second will be enough to power the entire lighting system. With 19 different types of environmental technology, this building will save 25% of its energy costs each year. We might not be the tallest building in the world, but we're definitely the tallest green building. The greatest green breakthrough of the Shanghai Tower will be its two layers of glass. As temperatures rise in the world, carbon emissions are increasing. The glass facades commonly used in skyscrapers do not retain heat well. This is a common criticism of skyscrapers today. The two layers of glass in this building will lessen this problem. The interior of the building will be less affected by temperature changes outside the building, causing it to be warm during the winters and cool during the summers. Compared to buildings with single-layer glass facades, this will reduce the energy used for air conditioning by 50%. A glass facade like this has never been used in buildings taller than 350 meters. Two Chinese glass manufacturing companies, one ranked the top in the world and the other ranked fifth, are working together to manufacture the facade for this building. But the difficulty in achieving this is creating problems for the experienced glass architects. They have to continually make adjustments to their plans. After three years of experimentation, they finally find a solution to this technical problem. The facade design is finally moving forward.
At the construction site, the 35th story of the core structure has finally been completed. But there is still a tough road ahead of them. In order to have the building completed by its scheduled date in 2015, the workers will have to install the glass facade while the structure is still being completed. The glass architects will have to make their final adjustments and tests in less than three months. This is the sample we made for the Shanghai Tower. For the sample, we built an approximate atrium to examine the effect between the inner and the outer layers of glass. In the center of this is the sky atrium. There will also be indoor parks, cafes and reading rooms in the future. People will be able to enjoy the warm sunlight hundreds of meters up in the air. There will be no concrete structures in this enormous space. Instead, steel buttresses propped onto the outer curtain wall will support the ring beams. The glass panels on the outer wall will be supported by these ring beams. These glass panels are being rushed into production using high-tech machinery and experienced technicians. These technicians will ensure that the glass panels pass stringent safety tests, the first of which is the fire resistance test. In 2011, a fire broke out in a skyscraper in Shenyang. The glass facade in the building shattered instantly, causing the flames to spread. The damage suffered was incalculable. It will be difficult to put out any fire when a building is 632 meters tall. A disaster like that has to be prevented. In a special laboratory 1,000 kilometers away, the glass panels of the Shanghai Tower are being tested for their fire resistance. In less than two minutes, the normal tempered glass shatters. After half an hour, the aluminum frame surrounding the glass begins to melt and the fire-resistant glass falls off its hinges. But the glass panel in the middle stays strong even after one hour in the 1,000 degrees Celsius heat. This gives people enough time to get to safety. In order to prevent any calamity from befalling the building, the glass on the inner wall has to withstand more intensive tests, like this, like this, And this. Or this. In the water town south of the Yangtze River, Yonglai Mo has to make sure that the glass on the outer wall doesn't fall off easily. Although the glass starts to crack when it is hammered at the edges, it does not shatter. You can see the interlayer of the glass right here. This means that the glass is completely broken, but still it hasn't shattered at all. This is the advantage of laminated glass. Most importantly, the glass on the outer facade needs to be resistant to external elements. It needs to be able to protect the interior of the Shanghai Tower through high winds, heavy rain and high pressure. Yonglai Mo and his team have built a large glass structure 36 meters wide, 24 meters tall, and 34 meters deep to test its resistance in a thunderstorm. A volume of water equivalent to 250 millimeters per hour is hosed onto the glass. Strong propeller winds are blown onto the most vulnerable part of the facade, its V-shaped grooves. We're using wind speeds of 40 meters per second here. That's equivalent to a scale 13 typhoon. This almost never happens in real life. If the glass facade passes this test, then the design is a success. After three days of experiments, the data produces optimistic results. But Yonglai Mo notices that although the water volume doesn't change, the flow of water is heavier at the bottom. There is water build up when water flows from above. This means that if there's too much rain, our drainage system will be impacted. The architects immediately get in touch with the engineers. They request for a bigger drainage system and for the angle of the panels to be changed so as to allow the water to drain more easily. This is how problems are found and solved one by one.
When I took on this project, I didn't think it was going to be very difficult. But as I delved deeper into the implementation of it, I found more and more problems. It just gets more and more difficult. Two thousand and eleven. It has been five years since work on the Shanghai Tower began. Close to two thousand people have worked on this project. I've worked on this project for about a year now. I've been doing experiments for about three years now. I've been three new years here now. I think that overall it will take me at least nine to ten years to finish this whole project. Through all this, there has been sweat, tears, suffering, and pain. It is just like running a marathon. Everyone involved has faced their own endurance limit. This is just like the most trying time in a marathon. We've been excited about it, and we've been perplexed by its problems. But the road ahead of us is still very long. But the moment to make them all proud is right ahead of them. In 2015, the Shanghai Tower will be completed. People from everywhere can work, shop, relax, and be entertained in this vertical city. They can stretch out and enjoy the 24 sky gardens. The building will have the fastest elevator in the world. Going at 18 meters per second from the first floor to the 119th floor, people will be able to take in a spectacular view of Shanghai from the observation deck on the top floor. They will be able to feel an incomparable sense of satisfaction and pleasure, and Shanghai will finally have a new, complete skyline.